Welcome to another edition of WTF 2020, an influencer's guide to navigating the shit show. My name is Peter Clayton. Thank you for tuning in. So what's your opinion of 2020 so far? Here's mine. The worst part of my day used to be logging on to news sites and seeing a constant stream of nothing but Trump's sneering face and Barr's perplexed face and Moscow Mitch's lying face. So I found a solution, a miracle, sort of. I stopped going to those sites. I no longer feel like I'm about to have a really bad case of diarrhea. And let's face it, this year would have been a shit show without COVID-19. It's just made our collective misery about, what, 20 times worse? I spoke to a good friend of mine in Geneva, Switzerland this morning, and I have to tell you, even the Europeans feel sorry for us. So... (laughs) So we're finally getting some girl power here on WTF 2020. I'm delighted to have on Total Picture Katrina Kibben, the CEO and founder of Three Ears Media. Katrina and her staff write job ads that don't suck. How about that? Pre-pandemic, Katrina was a frequent speaker at most of the events most of us watching and listening to this used to attend. Are you missing events? Are you living on Zoom? Can't wait to get back to your office. Let me know in the comments. So, Katrina, welcome to my WTF 2020 virtual bus tour across the country, uh, seeing my friends and influencers and trying to figure out how everyone is dealing with this shit show of not just the past six to eight months, but the past four years. So how are you and how is life in Colorado? Yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, You know, I love to bring the girl power and a little WTF anytime I show up. So, you know, this was right up my alley and uh, I'm just happy to be included and here. And, you know, we were talking a little before we clicked on the cameras and I was sharing that my big move has been to create an oasis in my house. And it sounds like we've both picked up um, collections of plants along the way to bring a little bring a little, uh, you know, just a better vibe to life when so much is happening outside our doors. Yeah. And it's, it really does have some, somewhat of a, a calming effect, you know, and you can talk to plants and they're nice, you know? Yeah. I talk to mine all the time. <laughs> yeah, me too. So, so how did you come up with the name three ears media for your company? Yeah. So three ears media is actually a name for that. I came up with and it's about two dogs with four ears. Um, but three ears is the idea first that we need to listen more than we talk. And the other part is that I think we should all be supporting each other. So often the job hunt is positioned as a marathon instead of an experience. And uh, the reason my dogs were part of that inspiration is because I have one dog who's a therapy dog and my other dog is actually disabled. And the therapy dog leads and guides the disabled dog and really fell into that role. And it was very natural. And I hope that recruiters can start to fall into the role of being truly helpful to other people. And I think the one way that we can very consistently do that is by mastering the ask. And the primary method of the ask is a job app. Awesome. That's really cool. So so how have you had to pivot your company in the past six or eight months? It's different, right? Yeah, no kidding. Dramatically in HR and recruiting, a lot of big projects I had where I was going in and doing entire process overhauls, those ended up falling on the team that was internal. Uh, Because recruiting was down, recruiting teams had to shift their role and do more of that operations work that my team would often step in and do. So my work has really shifted to training teams on how to write better job postings, creating libraries of examples that set that team off on the right tone, right? Because so often recruiters want to see a few examples and they can mirror and replicate those tactics. And the third is completely different in that I've actually pivoted the job posting and the tactics that I've learned from that content. And I've started helping job seekers with their LinkedIn profiles and really telling their story in a way that markets them 
so they can get a great job and tell their whole story and not just have the, you know, I am a collaborative leader who can passionately guide your team to their next role. Hey, clarity wins, whether it's a LinkedIn profile or a job ad. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's really cool. I'm, I'm glad you're doing that because, boy, it should, people sure need that help. You know, and LinkedIn, um, if you have a really good profile on LinkedIn, recruiters are going to find you. Exactly. And so I really approach it from that tactical place, but also that philosophical place, right? You should be writing for a human. This should be an intriguing story and something that people can remember. And so often there's so many competing voices when it comes to advice about LinkedIn profiles that they end up getting really confused. And the one thing I, I very rarely see, unless I, I wrote the post, <laughs> is that you should be 100% authentic. And if right. you show people who you are, that's, a, that's the best strategy you can take on a LinkedIn profile. You know, it, it seems to me that most job ads you see on sites like Indeed fall into one of two categories. One, they were written by the legal department, or two, Someone found an ad in their ATS from five years ago that matches the current job rec. Would you agree? Absolutely. The biggest mistake any team can make is starting a job posting by copying and pasting someone else's. Yeah. 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 And also, given the economy and the number of professionals who've been downsized and furloughed and laid off or bought off uh, over the past several months, I'm wondering if we're returning to... The, the job wrecks of the 2008-2009 recession, remember those when hiring managers decided that they could require a wish list of insane qualifications and experience even for entry-level jobs? Yeah. No, I unfortunately, I don't know that we had a true break <laughs> from those. Uh, we just hired more recruiters to start sourcing and building that one-to-one -one communication because at some point, someone convinced people that your best applicants don't come through job postings. But here's my pushback on that. Why wouldn't they? Why shouldn't they? Why would you cut yourself off at the foot when you're literally, you have a chance to make an impression, to make an ask, to invite someone to join your role and you just throw it, throw some garbage in there and hope the best that the recruiter will find them. Like, why? Why? Especially for entry-level jobs. Exactly. Especially entry-level jobs. Yeah. Mean. We, I mean, I, we get so caught up in the tactical on entry-level jobs. And often when I'm doing a hiring manager intake and I ask those questions, they say, well, there's no requirement. We're just looking for someone interested in X. And then I, I pull up the job that they've posted and I go, this is what you said the requirements are. You realize there's 27 bullets here. And you have, you actually have zero requirements, right? And that's a perfect opportunity to write something completely different, to write one paragraph that's really well developed, that talks about a day in the life, to set expectations for success, instead of assuming people know what you want, or assuming that people will still apply, even though you have set up the marathon, like I mentioned earlier, instead of a compassionate experience for someone who's never searched for a job before. So many of these things are, are just so cold and precision. Here's what we need. Here's the qualifications. Here's what you must have to even apply for this job. I mean, it's like a lot of these opportunities, they're really talking down to people. Yes. Right? They try to quantify experiences instead of qualifying candidates, right? Five years of experience. Would you believe I have never in my life met a hiring manager who knew the difference between four and five years? Bonus, I have never had a hiring manager tell me I need five years of experience. They actually say, I need them to have done this before. I need them to have managed a team of 25 or more. I need them to have experience in manufacturing. I, not once, and I've done thousands of job postings at this point, have I had someone hold true to, I need a number of years of experience. Yet, if I did a search for any word right now, I would find a job posting with years of experience in it. It's just crazy. Yeah. Are you a ninja warrior? 
Let's talk about gender bias in job ads, shall we, Trina? Absolutely. What are some of your favorites? Well, fun fact, uh, <laughs> you and I met back in the day when I worked at Monster.com 10 years ago, and my oh, job yeah. was Social Media Ninja. So I have special intimate knowledge of, of ninjas <laughs> and warriors and all these awful job titles and how they negatively influence someone's career. So I will never forget the day that a recruiter called me to get me out of monster.com. And he says to me, so what does a ninja do anyway? I mean, I'm lucky he even called me. The reason he called was not because of my skills or because he found my job title or he found my profile on LinkedIn. It was because the company told him to recruit people out of monster.com. So I got lucky. Most people don't get that lucky. Yeah. And so my biggest pushback on using that fluffy language, honestly, doesn't even touch the gender stuff yet. It touches on the fact that we put people at a disadvantage by making it up, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because other people, outsiders to your company have no knowledge of what that means and it's not universal. When we write job postings, when we add job titles, they need to have universal meaning in some way. And you need to validate that by using Google Trends, by looking at Google and actually searching a job title in the word resume and seeing if they come up. Now, as far as the bias, there's plenty. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, no right? Uh, you know, but I always, I push back a little bit because we have this dictionary of gender biased language. And we say a masculine term is this and a feminine term is that. And I struggle with that because I identify with masculine and feminine terms. And so really for me, it's about finding a balance and making sure that you're moving in the right direction, both when you're working on your job postings and removing simple bias and also looking into your company and identifying bias and doing that work. Because changing your job posting and building a pipeline of incredible can candidates from all backgrounds is not going to solve bias problems in your company. That's a bottom yeah, line. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it seems to me that you really have to get uh, some buy-in from the hiring managers in this whole process as well. Because we've all heard the the horror stories about hiring managers who, you know, went to the University of Alabama and he, they like to hire other people from the University of Alabama. Oh, 100%. Right? If you don't train your hiring managers. That's a massive mistake. And I can tell you, and this is actually a policy at my company. I will not write a job posting for you unless you let me talk to the hiring manager. I won't. And here's why. I truly believe that a better job posting is the consequence of asking better questions. And you as a recruiter probably don't have the answers to those questions, not the same answers as a hiring manager does. And let's get real. They are the decision maker, not us. We're a filter, not a decision maker. And so we need to understand it from their perspective to write a decent job posting and to really nail that clarity, right? To make it accurate. Because, you know, those AI tools, the gender decoders, the bias sorters, all of that, none of that works if you don't actually describe the job accurately in the first place. They are junk in, junk out systems. If you put a bad job posting that is inaccurate, no tool can tell you it's inaccurate. Interesting. So, so let's go a little bit deeper into this whole AI thing, because uh, I know that... Um, You've spoken on this topic at a number of conferences. So how is AI impacting what you do? Yeah. So I think a lot of people have the perception that it's tool or team, right? So I can buy this tool and all my job postings will be better, or I can hire this team. They'll write them and all of them are better. And in reality, AI is actually a combo system because AI only works if you have the right inputs. And most companies do not have the right inputs when it comes to job descriptions. Therefore, the AI can't work. It's not anything that the tool did. It's not anything that the company forgot. It's that we aren't putting the right data in, so we're not getting the right data out. So if you're thinking about AI in the context of job postings and content, you need both. You need a human eye, and then you need a tool 
to add the details and to really help you take it to the statistical level that the average person might not have a true data set on. Uh, our friend William Tincup recently interviewed on his use case podcast a guy named Daniel Fellows. And Dan works for a company called Optimal, which is a UK-based company that optimizes job ads using algorithms, AI and machine, machine learning powers their business, uh, specifically driving quality candidates and quality traffic to their job ads, supposedly. Um, are you working with companies like Optimal? And, and what do you think about this whole uh, reimagining that is happening with companies like Optimal, where they are, they're saying, all right, we want to drive the right candidates to your job posting? Because as we all know, for years, the problem that a lot of recruiters have had is they've just had way too many applicants and way, way too many applicants that really weren't qualified for those jobs. Right. You know, I have to be honest, I'm not. And the reason I'm not working with those companies is because I think there's an ethics issue here. So in the context of ethics and AI, we do not have the right data set. And let me explain what I mean. So Let's say I wanted to use AI to optimize for software engineers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I work at a company like Amazon where I have this enormous data set, right? Today, if I take any data set of software engineers, the primary gender of that data set is male. If I use that data set as my base and the AI and the machine learning take all of that and kind of manipulate it and make it better in their eyes, they started from a 60% male lean. We had more male applicants without changing anything else in the world. We're going to lean male, male, male. And suddenly your good pipeline, they all look the same. They all went to the same schools. They all, they're all male. And yeah. I have yet to meet a company who has taken on that moral obligation or even considered it in a way that I feel is Correct. And, and is a way that it at least is starting from the right moral compass. And I'm not saying I've not, I have not met every AI machine learning text tool in the space. I think Textio is probably the best of all of those groups from my mm -hmm. perspective. But broadly, I need to see that ethical accountability before I'd be willing to invest my time or energy in helping those companies be better. And that's that's just my perspective. Bringing up Amazon, we all know the very famous case that they had when they were actually trying to do something, right, to address the, the gender and bias issues. And after spending a lot of time and a lot of money, found that it, it didn't work. Yep. Right? Because it's crap in, crap out. Yeah. And let's, this is the reality. If Amazon can't figure that out, I think HR tech founders many of whom have very little recruiting experience are going to be able to build and scale a tool that's highly effective and does not produce bias. Yeah, absolutely. So Katrina, no more travel, no more live speaker gigs. Have you transitioned to speaking at virtual events? And if so, what, what kind of adjustment has that been for you? Yeah, you know, I have switched over to virtual. I had a very busy calendar as of March 6th and a very empty calendar as of March 16th, right? Yeah, so, I think that, that was true for a lot of us. It's like, holy shit. <laughs> right? That was my WTF moment when I was like, yeah. wow, my count, what just happened? You know, I had this whole image of the year and poof, gone. Yeah. Um, I think the hardest part for me, and I think you already know this about me, but I'm a very high energy speaker. I right. care. And you can tell, uh, which is a good and a bad thing, right? I, I have no poker face. I can't right. really soften myself, right? And you, you really know enjoy it. You really enjoy the, you know, the back and forth with the audience and really get, yeah. And that's really hard to do virtually. Yes. And it sucks me dry, right? That energy. I put so much in and then nothing happens versus when you go to a big conference and you put so much in and then the room goes wild and people come up to you afterwards and you get to have that interaction. You get to answer the one-off questions. You know what worked, you know what didn't. When I'm talking into the void, 
I just did my job, right? I, I just delivered my high energy and then nothing. And emotionally, that's really hard. I, I, you know, I think one, there's one advantage to this virtual world that we're all living in. And uh, Craig Fisher brought this up to me a couple of days ago when I recorded an interview with him is, you know, he's got this uh, event that he does every year in, in Dallas. And this year, which his event is going to be uh, November 20th. And he has a much broader spectrum of speakers from all around the world that are going to participate because it is virtual. And now he can have someone in South Africa participate where he traditionally he couldn't have afforded to fly somebody in from South Africa or, you know, a lot of the other places. So I, I think that that is one, at least one plus to this, although I don't know quite how we're going to address the issue of the back and forth and and the good vibes that are created at a live event yeah the closest i've come to it i worked with katiana sherm so this is southern louisiana uh, but they did zoom but they did it in a meeting format where i could actually right. see everyone and everyone had their cameras on and God bless them. They were so friendly and they were really looking at me and interacting with me. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time in a long time where I felt a little bit more human after it was all over. <laughs> and I didn't wow. have that. Like, I just did this shoot. Like I have all these endorphins. Right. And then it's just like beep, silence sitting in my room with my dog. <laughs> <laughs> How long do you think it's going to be Katrina before we're, we're back in Vegas or San Diego or some live event, especially on the scale of something like a, a Unleash or an HR Tech or, you know, a Sherm National. Yeah, I think it'll be at least a year, but I'm not a scientist or an expert in, uh, you know, vaccines and all of that. But I do think that something will have to happen medically to make people comfortable with being in those large spaces, masks or not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also it's, it's not just the fact that you may want to go back to a conference, but will your company allow you to go back to that conference? Will they pay for you to go back to that conference? Will the, uh, you know, the HR tech folks who buy the booths be willing to spend the 20, 30 grand that it, takes to go into these venues, right? Yeah. Well, and the company is taking on liability by sending you out, right? What That's if, right. if you're at an event that becomes a massive spreader and like a, a center of an outbreak? Uh, that's actually how it spread through the Northeast. I'm not sure That's if you right. read that. Yeah, story, it was, right? it was, was an like event huge, in Boston. Yeah. yeah, a huge healthcare conference with people from right. all over the world. And all of a sudden, boop, we have 10,000 cases, 20,000 cases. And I know from an HR perspective, right? An HR leader is probably going to be a lot more thoughtful uh, and analytical about making those choices than any other department in, across a company. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, you know, the, um, from what I'm hearing from HR leaders is their role has drastically changed with the pandemic because now they are more into a health and safety, right? Yeah. Um, attitude. They're what they're the ones responsible for bringing PPE and making workplace safe. Yeah. So their budgets have all shifted from buying fancy software to buying masks and sanitizers and stuff. Exactly. That's the big shift I've seen. I spoke, I speak with a lot of recruiters because I'm doing that one-on-one -on -one coaching. Right. Right. And many of these job seekers are people who have jobs now who want to get out of their job. And they shared with me that the role has fundamentally changed first by being the center of safety, but the second they've become a customer service center for the operations of the business. So when people don't know if the office is opening, they go to HR, not their leaders. When they aren't sure how tracing is working, how testing is working, 
those questions are coming to HR. And so the volume of questions coming into talent has increased tenfold, right? We've removed a lot of the recruiting requirements for most companies. Um, and some industries are still spiking major and they're, they're very, very busy right now. But I think the third, that the summary of all of that and the consequence of all of that is recruiting is an operations function all of a sudden. They are responsible for business operations and human needs. And that's just different for them. They've never been yeah. in that role of truly trying to optimize process, create better outcomes and create better systems. So I, you know, I talk to a lot of recruiters as well, and I keep hearing that really good recruiters are getting laid off and are now working contract jobs. Uh, are you hearing the same thing? It's, it's like recruiters have transitioned from the being FTEs, full-time employees, into a role similar to what a lot of sourcers have traditionally done, which is contract work. Exactly. Because companies are finally catching on that contingency is very, very expensive, right? Having an incredible recruiter on contract is just cheaper and it's smarter. It's smarter for your business because they actually understand your company. They start to understand the replicable hires. You know, you hire 100 nurses every year. Having a contract recruiter is a better option than a contingency team. And it's more affordable. Uh, the other thing that I'm hearing, which is sad, and it, it hurts my heart, is that a lot of these incredible recruiters keep being the second runner up. The talent pool is so big and so mm -hmm. broad, just like for Craig's event, right? He can have anyone from anywhere. Yeah, so can these companies. They can have anyone from anywhere. And so even the most talented people I know are getting these second runner ups, second runner up, because that job number wow. is very small and the pool is so big. That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point. Is the fact that if everything is going to be virtual, who cares where you live yeah. anymore? You know, and that used to be um, back to this interview that uh, William did with this this guy in the UK, you know, in, in, in job ads, it used to be here's the position, here's the location. Right. Yeah. So now the location may or may not really have any bearing on whether you're qualified for that job. Yeah. I'm actually encouraging companies to take that location section, put in your home base, and then add a paragraph that talks about where you're at right now. Um, one of the best examples I saw, they called it, there's an elephant in the room. And it says COVID has changed a lot for everyone in the world. And our business is no exception. Here's our plan for the next six months. And they outlined exactly what they plan to do with their office, what their deadlines are, and set the idea that for them, they will be back in the office. They're based in Australia. They're on the right path to getting there. And they're regularly updating that content to make sure that it's accurate and true. And I just love that they they called it out point blank and told people up front so they could get they could give people enough information to opt in or opt out, which frankly is the whole point of a job posting. Give me enough intel that I can say yes or no. That's really smart. You know, and that's such an easy thing for a company to do. Yes. Once they figure out what the hell they're going to be doing, of course. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. Because when I, so back in the day, I did a bunch of free job postings because I really wanted to understand how it works. The most common thing that I heard when I went out and did all of this, and this was Fortune 100s to mom and pop shop. I worked with everyone. Uh, they, 100%, I just don't know what's most important to this candidate. So I want to include everything. That's how job postings get so long. Right. But here's the reality. If you don't know the answer to that question, you're not the right person to be writing the job post. You don't have enough intel yet. And that's why what I mentioned earlier, you know, you have to have an incredible hiring manager intake. Hiring managers must be part of this process. So I want to return to something you, you briefly mentioned a little while ago. And, you know, you, you're in a, in sort of like a catbird seat, you really have a great understanding of what jobs are hot and what jobs are not. So what jobs are, are currently in demand? Yeah, the most popular project I'm working on right now is anything in manufacturing, warehouse or distribution. People are spending a lot of time at home doing a lot of Amazon ordering. 
my teams are making sure that those arrive at the door and those jobs aren't jobs that people really hunt down, right? Mm -hmm. They're low skill, they're average pay at best. And for many of them, they were making more money on unemployment than they were making in manufacturing. And I want to say, I'm not sharing that as a shame on them for not working. That is not where I'm going with this at all. It's, it's a shame to me that these companies don't pay at least that, but different, different podcast, different WTF podcast yeah. for us. Yeah. Um, but consistently I'm getting machine workers, electricians, warehouse, anyone who's working on a line and actually fulfilling distribution right now is very in demand. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and I think to that point, you know, I go into Whole Foods and two thirds of the people in there are Instacart shoppers, right? So yeah. it's, it's those kinds of jobs that are in great demand, but really don't pay much. Mm -hmm. And you're lucky if there are any benefits that go along with them, right? Exactly. And the other piece, I mean, if you've been in some of the big box stores or like a Target, you'll notice the shelves are empty. Yeah. That's because we haven't put these people in the warehouse and distribution center roles yet. These companies are majorly struggling. Wow. So what, what has inspired you, if anything, over the past seven or eight months, Katrina? You know, I bringing on that LinkedIn rewrite as part of my services uh -huh. has put me in a position to be inspired a lot because I get 30 minutes to hear their entire story, right? Their whole life, kind of that, that weird path of experiences and things that brought you to where you are today. I get to do that almost every day, right? And I get to listen to someone's story and then I get to write their story in a way that makes them proud. And nothing makes me more happy than having someone come to me and say, you know, I, I keep looking at my profile because I can't believe it's so good. Like that's me. And, and to me, that will always bring a little bit of extra joy and endorphins to my life. And, and so I, I feel really lucky that I've been able to do that at the volume that I've been able to do it at. That, that's really cool. And, and, and I agree, you know, as, as much suffering as we're seeing right now, to be able to just do something on a daily basis that brings joy to someone else's life really must be uh, very fulfilling for you. Yeah. I mean people cry in these sessions. We laugh, we joke, you know, like I therapy. Really, yes. it's be like therapy, right? It really yeah. is. And, and it's therapy, whether the work is good or bad, right? Whether you hated your boss or you loved your last job, leaving a job is very traumatic, right? It changes your whole life. That's the definition of trauma, a moment that changes everything. And so I, I just don't think we've created enough spaces for people to vent, to let it out, to feel it. And I'm really glad that I've been able to kind of contextualize that in the deliverable. So they get a little bit of therapy and a little bit of actionable something that can help them get one step in the right direction. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because, you know, it's specifically in this country, uh, people identify them, their self-worth with their careers and their jobs to a really insane level, you know, like if you don't have a job, then you're you, somehow you're, you're no, you no longer have any value to yeah. society. Right. Yep. Remember earlier when I was joking that I'm the only person who writes about being authentic on a LinkedIn profile, right? Yeah. Like, I think I'm also one of the only people who writes about the psychology of a job search, meeting the tactical because looking for a job is a psychological event. It happens in your head before it happens on paper. It's an emotional choice. I mean, I've never met anyone who woke up in the morning and was like, hmm, I'm going to quit my job today. You know, right? Like not anyone who has a real job. It's like, and let me rephrase that. Not anybody who has a commitment in their life that requires the responsibility of having a job. And that commitment could be your home, your bills, your family, whatever. When you have that kind of commitment and we tie that commitment to work, it's an emotional choice. It's not just a, you know, wake up in the morning and stretch it out and then send your two weeks notice. That's not how we do things. Yeah. Well, speaking about that, what advice do you have for folks who are looking for a job currently? Yeah. You know, it's hard. 
So I think the first thing is to be kind to yourself, uh, to find things like plants or sunshine or the arrow garden that I just plugged in as some source of joy in your life. I'm going to have to check out this arrow garden thing, Katrina. I'm totally going to send you some texts after this. Um, No, I'm a big fan. And, and, And find joy while simultaneously finding tactics. And the other piece of advice uh, that I would give, and you know, I can't answer all of it. I can't, I don't know everything right. about job search, but something that my friend John Sumser told me is that you should always have a buddy. And I think that's an idea that most job experts don't talk about is that you need emotional support outside of your family when you're job searching. Someone you can check in with regularly who really helps you assess where you're at that can celebrate progress in any direction because job search it only has one big win, right? You get the job. That means there's 99% disappointment. That's right. right? And having a buddy can just really help your mental health. So I think if I could give one piece of advice, it would be get a buddy and really take care of your mental health in addition to taking on the tasks that everyone tells you to do when you're job searching. I think, I think that's a, a really really great advice and something that could be very helpful to a lot of people. And you're absolutely right. It can't be a family member because generally if you're in a job search, that means you don't have a job. So the stress level with everyone within your immediate family is going to be very high. So you really need to go outside of your family to find a good friend who has empathy and that you can bounce some ideas off of uh, um, that, that, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Yeah. I, you know, I think we just have to set ourselves up, especially right now with mental health success, right? We live in a world that will constantly attack your senses, uh, whichever one you want to choose, we can go down the list, right? No matter what side of the aisle you sit on your senses, your sense of well being is being attacked daily. Right. And, and so I just, we have to invest in self-care right now, whether you have been looking for a job for six months, three months, three days, invest in self-care. And that's whether you're employed or unemployed. Good advice. One last question. And I, I really appreciate your time, Katrina. What would you like to share that we haven't discussed? You know, I think I just want everyone to remember that we're in a new age. The world is different today than it ever has been. And I think when it comes to content, when it comes to writing from the recruiting perspective, I want more people to consider that personal is professional now, right? We don't go out of our way to read textbooks or job descriptions, right? We go out of our way to connect with other humans because we need that. We need that to survive the environment today. And so I just really encourage people to always think of the person you're writing for and center yourself in consideration and empathy, not copying and pasting other people's stuff and considering that, you know, what's out there probably isn't best for you. So how can people connect with you, Katrina? Yeah. So I'm very lucky. I'm the only Katrina Kibben in the world. So if you spell my name right, you will find me. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today and best of luck and uh, let's stay in touch.